Southern Methodist Church. My name is Mark, one of the pastors here. Uh, Pastor Rachel is camping, I think, this weekend. She's not here, so um, we're grateful for her to have time off. I want to do three things before we worship. One is to make you aware of these prayer cards. If there's something or someone for whom you'd like us to be in prayer uh, later on in our worship service, you'll find in the pews one of these. You can fill these out. We don't need a lot of information. First name. Are we praying for healing or for... Is it a joy? Is it a concern? And you'll notice on the cards an opportunity to check a box that says prayer letter. Uh, our tradition is when asked, we send letters to folks to let them know that they've been held in prayer during our worship service. At the conclusion of worship, those letters, although I'm told that John Bolton is writing those letters, and I don't see him here. I wonder if he knows he's writing those letters. I do see him here. John Bolton. John Bolton. I understand you're, are you writing the prayer letters today? Excellent. So it's our tradition to have prayer letters and John Bolton's gonna be writing those letters and they will be on the counter in the back of the service, um, on the counter at the back of the service. You don't need to know the person in order to sign the letter, this, is, this lets people know that our church families held people in prayer and, and people greatly appreciate that. So if you would like a prayer letter sent, check the box. And if it's someone not on our, uh, in our directory, please let us know what their address is. Also, uh, along the center line aisle, there's these red books. We invite you to let us know you're here. Not mandatory, but if uh, you are willing, let us know you're here, especially uh, visitors, or if you're a regular attender and contact information has changed. Those are the announcements. Now, a story, and then we're going to sing. I believe he was, he was either six or seven years old, <clears throat> and uh, we had moved to a new church. He was in first grade, I believe, and it was bath time, and he was in the bathroom having a bath. His mom was taking care of him, and I was just a couple rooms away in the, the church office, what happened, which happened to be in the parsonage. And um, I heard this scream come out of the bathroom. My first thought was something, there's been a medical emergency, that our son is drowning or something horrible has happened. So I ran to the bathroom and my wife, uh, Jan, was standing there uh, with our naked little boy in the bathtub she looked at me with these terrified eyes. This is how I remember it. Now, Jan is here. She might clarify this later. Uh, this is how I remember it. She looked at me, and, and then she looked at our son, and she said to him, I'd like you to ask your father what you just asked me. And then she left. She left the bathroom. We're going to sing. It's in the small black hymnal, The Faith We Sing, words will also be on the screen. It's number 2218, You Are Mine. So let's pray, and then I'll play an introduction, and we will stand and sing together. Help us, O oh God, to remember today who we are, where we're from, and whose we are. And I pray that in the time we spend together, we could take a deep breath, and be mindful of the fact that in this moment, no one is a stranger. That visitors are now part of our family. That we are the body of Christ with our gifts and our talents, with our pain and our sadness, with our dreams, with our joys. And what a privilege it is to be together now. May we be confident not only of your forgiveness, but of the power of your love at work and help us to know that we are yours. May your spirit breathe life into our time of worship now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
going to be reading from Psalm 45. Um, we'll read responsively. It's not in the hymnals today. Um, you'll find the words up on the screen. Psalms 45. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one, clothe yourselves with splendor and majesty. Let your sharp arrows pierce the heart of the king's enemy. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh, aloes, and cassia. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. Listen, daughters, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. All glorious is the princess within her chambers. Her gown is interwoven with gold. Her virgin companions follow her, those brought to be with her. there are any young people who want to come forward, you can. You don't have to. Um, you have to be able to see what's on the screen. I want to share a, a story with you called What Would You Say? So you can come forward and sit right here, or you can stay where you are, wherever you're most comfortable. And um, we'll see where this, <clears throat> where this takes us. First of all, let's just sort of look at the picture of this little person up on the screen. What, what, what do you think she's hearing? Uh, doesn't, you think she's hearing nothing with an expression like that? What do you think she might be hearing, anybody? It's grandma. grandma. Yeah, maybe it's a call from her broker. I mean, I don't know. Okay, we're going to look at pictures, and I'm going to ask, what would you say? Okay, so let's look at the first picture. <clears throat> first of all, let's talk about what, well, no, let's, let's just say, what would you say? You'd say, why are you doing that? What is the that that this little person seems to be doing? <clears throat> yes, playing with the knobs that, that regulate the gas. What, what is this little person in danger of experiencing? Flames, burn, right. So what would you say? You'd say what? Don't do that, be careful. Somebody said stop, right? You'd probably say, or... Some people might say, no, 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 don't do that. Okay, let's look at the next picture. What are these two little people? No, what would you say? What would you say to these two little people? Not a good idea. The second, Catherine. What would you say, Catherine? What would you say? Don't touch. Yeah. Why would we say don't touch? What, what, are, what, are they, what are they near? An electrical outlet. Yes. In fact, some of the rooms in this church have things on the electrical outlets that are almost impossible to get off. 
because every now and then I have to plug in a lamp and it takes a papal encyclical and an act of Congress and, you know, 20 days of prayer and fasting to get this thing out. I mean, those things are in there. But yes, we would probably say, don't touch that. Actually, where are the adults? I, I might say, where are the adults? Taking the picture. <laughs> right, we're gonna post it on Facebook. Okay, let's, let, I think we have another picture, let's see. Don't touch that. I would, I would shout, stop. I'd say, what are you doing? What do you think this little person is doing right now? He was gonna, he was gonna cut himself. Yeah, well, maybe. But the thing we don't know is, is the iron hot? We don't know that, right? And that's a really bad way to find out. That's a terrible way to find out. Okay. We have one more picture. Let's look at this picture. Now, I'm not going to ask you what would you say. What is she saying? Stop. Stop. Who, who is she saying it to? The person who's taking the picture. Maybe she doesn't want her picture taken. Yeah. We try to be really careful, you know, in our church because we post the service. There's a camera back there that's looking at me right now. And, uh, but we try to be very careful that we don't put people, except for, you know, the people up here, on the, on the camera. We don't, we don't, we have to be careful about that, right? Maybe she's saying stop to somebody who's trying to hug her and she doesn't want to be hugged. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever gotten a hug from somebody and you're really... Maybe, you know, even your parents on occasion. <laughs> so, it's okay to say stop. When somebody's doing something, when somebody's about to touch something that's going to hurt them, it's also okay to say stop. If somebody's going to touch you, if somebody's going to bully you, or touch you in ways that make you uncomfortable, it's okay to say Stop. That includes me. You can tell me, stop. Now, I prefer if you don't tell me to stop while I'm preaching. <laughs> Sometimes I can see it in people's faces. They're going, like that. But anyway, remember that, okay? Remember, it's okay to say, stop. Let's pray together. Jesus, you never touched anybody unless they asked you to, unless they came to you and said, please, Lord, heal me, whether it was their vision or their legs or some pain they had. And you don't touch us unless we let you. As much as you love us and surrounded as we are by your love for us, you never force yourself on us. Keep us safe. And help us to be confident and comfortable to ask people to stop when they're doing something or saying something that hurts us. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, thank you. Good job. Good job. You can say stop now. I'm done. I'm done. What's your favorite love song? Do you have one? Anybody have a favorite love song? Wow. Well done. Anybody else? Choir starting up soon.
<laughs> when I was growing up, she loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It didn't make it for me. But it was a great, I, I, mean, I remember listening to that song. She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time Jan says to me, I love you, I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Adam's going to sing a love song for Emily, Whenever I May Find Her, written by Paul Simon. So let's listen and um, see what you think. a dream I had pressed in organdy clothed in crinoline of smoky burgundy softer than the rain I wandered empty streets down past the shop display I heard cathedral bells tripping down the alleyways as I walked on. And when you ran to me, your cheeks flushed with the night, we walked on frosted fields of juniper. Now we'll be reading from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 8 through 17. Listen, my beloved. Look, here he comes. Leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young heart. Look, 
there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Darling, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear in the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit and blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, my darling, and come with me, O oh beautiful one. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the little foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards and the vineyards that are in bloom. My beloved is mine, I am his. He browses among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young heart, a stag, on the rugged hills. And now reading from the New Testament, Matthew, uh, chapter 5, portion 33 to 37. Again you have heard that it was said to the Lord long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill the Lord the vows that you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. All you need say is simply yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be the word of the Church, politics, tennis, sports, entertainment, academia, hard to read an article these days without a reference to scandal. And scandal is almost always about sex. Stephen Marsh wrote an article, and in it he says, for most of history we've taken for granted the implicit brutality of male sexuality. And it is this masculine libido and its accompanying forces, he writes, and pathologies that drive so much of culture, politics, and our economy. But, counters a letter in response, those who have allowed themselves to harass and or assault targets they deem easy to conquer are catering to their ego needs, not their bodily needs. Well, the obvious problem with that critique is that we're all addicted to our ego. You are. I am. We're addicted to our ego, our ego needs. And that ego, our psychology, and our bodily needs, our physicality, how do you separate them from one another? Well, then there's the challenge to distinguish between what I need and what I want, what I crave. I delight to rest in the shadow of my lover, and his fruit is sweet to my mouth. So declares the female voice in the beginning of chapter 2 of the Bible's Song of Songs, a book of physical cravings? Is this book of the Bible about sex? Is it about erotic desire? It never once mentions God. The rabbis say this book is the holiest of all the holy books. Rabbi Akiba said, 
The day Shir Hashirim was given to the Jewish people was a day the world was not deserving of. Song of Songs, sometimes referred to as the Song of Solomon, is seen by Jewish commentators as the literary peak expressing the intimacy between God and God's chosen people. Well, let's look at this title, Shirim Hashirim. The Hebrew identifies the text as an exemplary literary creation, writes Renita J. Weems in her commentary. She says, anytime you run into repeated words, God of gods, Lord of lords, vanity of vanities, you're talking about superlatives. And so, Song of Songs, Shirim Ha Shirim, suggests to us something superlative is being offered to us. And she says that perhaps the better title for this book would be The Most Excellent of Songs or The Most Sublime of Songs. The Talmud cautions against anything other than an allegorical interpretation. A literal interpretation is not allowed. But come on, I mean, if you read the book, Imagine, I can just imagine some wise guy like Adam Hall taking these words and putting them to a body tune. Your hair is like a flock of goats. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes. Your lips are like a scarlet strand. Your cheek is like half a pomegranate. Your breasts are like twin fawns. In the early second century, Rabbi Akiba wrote, He who trills his voice in chanting the song of songs in the banquet house, that is a bar or a, you know, a karaoke, and treats it as a sort of song, has no part in the world to come. Don't make fun of this song, Adam, or you're going to hell. Religious folk have been trying to suppress and subvert human sexuality since the Garden of Eden, haven't we, right? So is the Song of Songs to be understood as allegory? Scholar J. Paul Tanner acknowledges the firm resistance over the centuries to take this song at its face value. Tanner writes, advocates of the allegorical view have been adamant that there must be be some spiritual message to the book that exceeds the earthly theme of human sexuality. These allegorical interpretations include, but are not limited to, the Jewish allegorical view that the book symbolically describes the relationship between God and the people of Israel. The primary Christian allegorical view that says the book symbolically describes a relationship between Jesus and the church. The secondary Christian allegorical view, which says the book symbolically describes Mary in support of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Martin Luther believed the bride in this book is the state under the rule of King Solomon. The early 17th century Johannes Cosius says this imagery in the Song of Songs is directly linked to the book of Revelation. William E. Phipps writes, it is one of the pranks of history that a poem so obviously about hungry passion has caused so much perplexity and has provoked such a plethora of bizarre interpretations. Say that ten times really fast. J. Paul Tanner writes somewhat understatedly, the fanciful allegorical interpretations lack objectivity as well as any means of validation. Obviously, he's a scholar. <laughs> Religious people, we have a way of either ignoring or denying the obvious, especially when it comes to human sexual behavior. I don't think I read one article about Pope Francis in Ireland that did not make some mention of the clergy sex scandal in the Catholic Church. 
The authority of the church, writes Jason Horowitz in the New York Times, has been eroded by deepening secularization and a global sex abuse crisis challenging the papacy of Francis. Randy Alcorn is a respected evangelical author and teacher, and he says, the evangelical landscape is littered with the carcasses of lives and ministries decimated by sexual sin. For every well-known Christian television personality or evangelical leader who commits sexual immorality, he says there are many, any number of lesser-known local pastors, Bible teachers, and parachurch workers who quietly resign or are fired for the same. And then, says Alhorn, Alcorn, because congregations don't do their due diligence, diligence in terms of, of background checks, they hire these people who then continue the same abusive behavior. While some church leaders run and hide under cover of allegory, others sign Bibles and present them to political leaders who boast of their sexual exploits. The oft-touted family values crumbles beneath the temptation of power and political gains. We're unwilling to talk about sexual abuse when it hides, and we don't want to acknowledge it when it stares us arrogantly in the face, mocking us in all of our religious and moral rhetoric. What if we were to take seriously our sexual appetites? Stephen Marsh, who I quoted at the beginning of the message, writes in the same article, a healthy sexual experience requires a continuing education. How many people would sign up for that course? Continuing education. But Christians can't continue our sexual education if we're not willing to start it. If we can't have an open conversation, a humble conversation, a gentle conversation to begin with. What if we acknowledge the reality of lust, the power of and the potential danger, as well as the blessing of the male libido? What if we accept what all of us experience as teenagers? Hormones coursing through the veins of our youth, mysterious, wonderful attractions that are truly satisfied when there is mature consent. I remember the very first day I saw a girl standing at her locker. And I did not think, boy, she's smart. I didn't think, I bet she's rich. I thought, she's gorgeous. She's hot. And I had to go ask my girlfriend what this other girl's name was. <laughs> to find out that it was Jan Marie Flanagan. Read the entire book of Song of Songs, and from both the male and the female perspective, there is mutual longing. And while the imagery is culturally awkward, I have tried the line, your hair is like a flock of goats, and that's gotten me nowhere. But, what a dream I had. Pressed in organdy, clothed in crinoline of smoky burgundy, softer than the rain, I held your hand. My sexual education intensified when I got married. Waking up, feeling Jan warm against me and kissing her hair, honey-colored or whatever color it happens to be. In marriage, as elsewhere, there must be consent. There must be consent. It is wrong to admit, without any need to share any details with any of you, but... Is it wrong to admit that I love my wife? That she is my sex ed teacher? That she's the one who loves me and forgives me? Who embraces me? That she's the one who has transformed the male libido in me? She's changed lust 
to love. Now, I don't need to get all spiritual about that. But let me just say, I experience it as a miracle. No mention of God in the book of the Song of Songs. Sharing that distinction with only one other book in the Bible, the book of Esther. But in the book of Esther, we read all about Jewish feasts and prayer and fasting. So there are all sorts of, of religious uh, implications in that book. Not, not so much in Song of Songs. But sure as the sunset can be a spiritual experience, so too can our sexuality when expressed in a loving, committed consensual relationship, it can lead us closer not only to our beloved on earth, but to our God in heaven. Let's pray together. Perhaps most of us here, O oh God, have experienced awkward moments when Conversations either with children or with parents or perhaps with lovers have pushed us um, to uncertain places. Perhaps all of us here have in some way or another imposed our physical desires on someone we love, putting them under the banner of what we need Perhaps all of us are in need of some measure of forgiveness. And perhaps all of us are in need of some kind of liberation. Some miracle that can cut us free from taboos and from a mindset that suppresses who we are, what we want, and what we need. And perhaps our society is now in the throes of what happens when we hide from what is real, when we abuse other people's bodies, when we take advantage of positions where another does not have the prerogative to say no. We are grateful for the bodies you've given us and for the yearnings we experience. We're grateful for all the ways we can express our love. And we pray, we pray that we would grow, that our education, sexual and spiritual, emotional and physical, would continue as we become more and more the individuals and the people you want us to be. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to give our gifts and our tithes, and as we do so, we're going to sing. It's a tune that I think you're very familiar with. It's in the red hymnal, if you need uh, the tune. Number 644. Yes, we joy of our desiring. We'll remain seated and let's sing uh, as we give our gifts and our tithes.
John Bolton, do you have prayer concerns? great thanksgiving. We invite you to uh, join with me. There will be portions of this prayer which we will say together. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, eternal God. You created us in love. You created us for love. We can be free from greed and pride, from hatred and arrogance. Every day you offer us the opportunity to turn toward you, to let your grace embrace us. And so we join our voices with all creation in the hymn of gratitude and praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus came anointed by your spirit, preaching the good news to the poor. Those held captive by addictions can be free. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. In the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ, your church was born. We are liberated from sin and celebrate the covenant you made with us by water and the Spirit. He lifted the bread in gratitude. He broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. He lifted the cup in gratitude. Then he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you eat this bread and drink this cup, eat and drink in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your people gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, even as we, woman and man, from every race and tribe, consent to be knit together as one, the body of Christ, serving as Jesus served. We lift up these prayers together. For this one's mother, who has congestive heart failure, but thanks be to God is doing better. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That things will go well in court for Tripper. Lord, in your mercy. For woman, a woman undergoing surgery for appendicitis this morning. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, hear the prayers that your people pray. The ones we speak out loud and the ones that we speak in the quiet of our hearts. Thank you for your love for us, for your intimate knowledge of who we are. 
what concerns us and what we celebrate. Together, let us pray. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, loving God. Amen. And now, as the words appear on the screen, let's pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. My friends, the body and blood of Christ are broken and shed for each of us. Amen. You don't need to be a member of this church or any particular denomination. You don't need to have a certain amount of faith. All you need to do is come, because the invitation is for everyone to come and to break bread together. Jesus is the host at the table. And so as you come, I will break bread and give you a piece of the bread, and then you can step to either side, and you can either take a small cup and uh, drink the cup and place the empty cups on the trays um, on the side, or if you prefer, you can dip the bread into the chalice. There are several folks who have asked to come and help me with communion, and if you'd like to come forward now, I would be grateful. Come.
Jesus, we're grateful for the invitation to come to the table, to be physically present, to touch these elements, trusting that when we do so, in some very special and powerful way, the very grace and love of God touches us back. Thank you for the invitation to be present. And in a few moments as we depart one another's company, may others experience in us this ongoing invitation, the presence of grace and hope, We are blessed. Help us remember it and to express our gratitude with joy. We pray in your name. Amen. <coughs> Tomorrow's Labor Day, so it's funny, isn't it? On Labor Day, we don't work, some of us. I mean, you'd think we'd call it something else, you know? Lack of Labor Day, don't Labor Day or something. But anyway, tomorrow's Labor Day, so the office will be closed. Um, uh, what else? Staff Parish meets this week, on Tuesday night this week at 7. And what else? Godly Play starts. Oh. Training for Godly Play in the Reed Booth Room right after worship. And Sunday school starts next week. I'm not, I think Timothy's, I mean, um, youth group, I'm not, does it start this, does it say, does it start this week or next week? Next week. I see your mouth moving, but I don't know what you're saying. It starts soon. That's a, that's a, I like that. Youth group starts soon. I like it. Okay. September 11th. September 11th it starts. Which, okay. Thank you, Adam. So, um, Jan left the bathroom, and I'm standing there. And I look down, and my little six or seven-year-old boy naked in the tub, playing with his rubber ducky, looks up at me and asks me what a word means that I probably shouldn't use in church. But it begins with the letter F. Daddy, what does mean? After I hiccuped, um, I wanted to say, let me get your mother. <laughs> but we've been through that, so... Um, I said, this is what it means. It's a slang word that sometimes people use in a, in a way that's not all that good, but to talk about what people do when they love each other. It should be a word that really describes what two people do if they love one another. But I said, it's not a good word to use. Try not to use it in your mother's presence. <laughs> That's not a good word to use. And, and he was fine with that. And so if I'd been a really good husband, I would have finished giving him his bath. But I didn't. I called for Jan. I said, get back in here. <laughs> and, and I left. You know, you're not very old when you hear about this stuff when you are exposed to stuff whether it's living or dying whether it's the um, <laughs> and all the details in the middle how do we talk about this stuff in ways that are meaningful and age appropriate how do we continue our own education as sexual human beings by the way, all of you, your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> Except for some of you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about, we're going to sing a song about seasons. It's number 2076 in the faith we sing, the small black hymnal, but you're not going to need the books for this. Words will be on the screen. You know this tune. Let's be mindful of uh, God's love, God's presence. Let's be grateful for those who love us. Let's be grateful for those who let us touch them and embrace them. And let us be grateful for those whose embrace for us is healing and 
grace-giving. And by the way, if there are those of you who, like the song suggests, you know, for Emily, whenever I may find her, it's really worth, it's really worth looking for the right one. pray for God's blessing. Because we have first been loved, O oh God, it is in us to be able to love one another in ways that bring hope and healing, joy, forgiveness, and life. And so bless your people as we go about our business for this week. Remind us when we feel forgotten or set aside, remind us that we're loved and set us to doing the work of loving our neighbor, even as you have loved us. Bless this congregation, I pray, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let's greet each other in